Hey, Working Preachers, we want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to the 2024 spring campaign. If this was your first gift to Working Preacher, thank you. If this was your 15th or 30th gift, thank you. And if you give monthly as a sustainer, we thank you. Thanks to your generosity, we met our ambitious $75,000 goal, and you unlocked a $10,000 matching gift. All of you are amazing, and we appreciate your support. Thank you. We know you rely on Working Preacher, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. So thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. On June 30th, 2024, we will celebrate the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and we'll celebrate it with these first readings, either Lamentations 3, 22 through 33, or 2 Samuel 1, 1, and then verses 17 through 27. The psalm is Psalm 30. We have a second reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15, and the gospel text is Mark 5, 21 through 43. Really exci- insightful commentary, don't you think, Caroline? Uh, very much so. <laughs> no, really, no, in all seriousness, thank you very yeah. much, um, Matt, for your commentary. So we want to note to our listeners that uh, Matt is on board with uh, with commentaries for the next four. Is, is it four weeks in a row on Mark? So Mark, Mark in chapter row. five and six. So I'm not going to speak for the next ten minutes or so. Um, not if we can help unless, it. <laughs> unless provoked in some way. I'm going to try and provoke you. Uh, I I always appreciate the comparison um, uh, between those that are healed. But what I really appreciated, Matt, was your um, the recognition of the anti-Semitic readings that have dominated how these texts have been read and the implications um, that they put on how, how we live today. Um, so if we want our listeners to be considerate citizens, we need to invite them to um, develop reading patterns of the texts that are respect- respectful and responsible so that they can translate into practices that are respectful and responsible um, to the context of all of our neighbors near and far. So I really appreciated that. That was, yeah, very helpful, very important. Uh, This story is just, well, this section of Mark uh, is just so uh, striking in, of course, Mark's usual narrative pattern of intercalation, but having one story inserted within another story and all of the different kinds of of overlapping connections that you're making between the two stories and the m- multiple interpretive places that you can go uh when you when you put these stories together and so that's i i think that's one that's one i mm, one thing that i would direct Creatures too. I mean, you could narrate all the connections, but at one point and at some point in time, do you need to land on one uh, mm-hmm. to give yourself give your sermon a focus? I mean, you can, and I hope I hope you understand what I mean by that. I mean, there's just these, you know, the the twelve years and. The, all, all, all there's just so many. Um, and Jairus is, falls at Jesus' feet. She falls at she falls at Jesus feet. I mean, there's just all these different, um, uh, you know, these overlappings, but, but the preacher then has to decide with the, with those overlappings, what then, what then connection, um, does your congregation then need to hear this week? Uh, what, what about these two stories, heard together what what is that point of connection that becomes uh, the pastoral uh, move or the gospel move that the preacher that the preacher needs to make otherwise it becomes just this sermon about look at how much these stories are alike if that right makes sense at all. right yeah it becomes a book report yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. 
So threading together, um, uh, again, um, Jesus has crossed again in the boat to the other side. We're back on land. A crowd gathers. Um, and um, I, I jump into this story and love uh, just kind of being in the, the, the fullness of the moment where um, it's rush hour traffic uh, on the opening of a WNBA home game in Indianapolis. And, and, and someone doesn't move quickly enough for the ambulance to slip through. And the driver, and in my particular metaphor right now, that would be Jesus, stops, gets out, looks around and says, uh, who hit us? And it's like, really, Jesus? We need to get to where we're going? And you're going to, I mean, of course, somebody's going to bump into us in the midst of all of this. Um, I love centering around that reality of the moment uh, on the ground. Um, and so I, I, I would invite preachers where they're going to land to allow the details of the story and the context that this is taking place in mirror how they, if they, if they preach the stilling of the storm to mirror the way that they detailed that in how they turn to their focus for this one, just so that the reality of all of Mark's um, um, gospel is, is on display here without having to say it, demonstrate it. I really imagine Jairus here just like thinking, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Dude. She'll still be here in a half hour. You can come back and talk to her then. You know what I mean? Just And then Jesus, I see looking over his shoulder saying, keep on believing. <laughs> you know, and just, yeah. you know um, I know exactly what I'm doing here. It's, but yeah, it, it puts Jairus through a little bit of uh, extra stress, I imagine. You think? Yeah. Yeah. One thing that, uh, there are a couple things that are really striking to me um, with this story, but and uh, uh, for some reason, particularly this year, the first is uh, the first is the language around touch and mm-hmm. that uh, you the the contrast between in verse thirty one, the crowd pressing in on Jesus, and yet he knows, that he has been touched, um, who touched my clothes. Well, like masses of amounts of people. (laughs) Um, but yet, but that he, to recognize that touch. And then when uh, in verse 41, when he raises Jairus's daughter, uh, he took her by the hand, but it's really like he grasped her by the hand and, um, and raised her up. And so this, uh, this, the, mm, the power of touch to, mm, to, uh, to heal, but not just to heal. And in this case to, uh, you know, you're not just, your faith has made you well, but your faith has saved you. And then for a little girl, get up, it's not just get out of bed. It's arise. It's a gay row. It's, you know, uh, which is connected to Jesus' own resurrection. And so there's so much going on besides um, uh, that that is going to happen in that in that touch and that connection with Jesus. And so um, especially when there are moments of uh, when there are suspicions of well, what would what what would it mean then to be touched or to touch Jesus, the power of that. So that's um i don't know i i found that to be an important um detail that i appreciated this year there's another thread uh we talked about last week in terms of uh the question of um faith and um in this in this question becomes uh the woman's heard about jesus and has that faith um, and so there's a there's another thread that can be can be pulled through there depending on what you did you know the week before. Um, I I just love to be able to each year around that we're t- we're going through a gospel to be able to find something to thread all the way through, 
Um, and that's, that's another link that could be drawn out. Noting, um, uh, as, as, uh, as you have, um, noted, um, Matt, in terms of not, that it's not the faith, there's a lot of times when, well, when, even in the previous, uh, episode where the healing or the salvation comes, um, without the, um, salute to the strength of faith. Well, and yeah, and what if it's, I think I mentioned in here, what if faith is just desperation? What if it's just another word for desperation? What if it doesn't have to have a kind of magnitude or a kind of cognitive, you know, what if you, what if you don't even know who Jesus is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but you just know he's your last chance, right? That maybe this, maybe this idea is crazy enough it could work. Like maybe that's all it requires. It reminded me, well, it always does, of there's a, and you've been here, I don't know if you've been there, um, Joy, but the mural at, at Magdala of this story down in the lower level of the of the church uh, mm-hmm. and the the mural where it's just the feet mm-hmm. of of Jesus and all Jesus these other feet and, the, and it's just that one little thing <laughs> that's reaching yeah. out uh, and trying to touch his cloak. And that's when you, when you describe it that way, Matt, that's what I think about. Just, it's like, it's not even grabbing on. It's not even holding on. It's just that, that one finger that's trying to reach for just the hem and, uh, and the way in which that could, uh, that could be a way to describe what faith is. Um, just reaching out and it could be a, a way, uh, a way to picture it that that one finger reaching out in desperation um and and that's sometimes all you have and sometimes all it takes uh uh to yeah as a as an act of as an act of faith and i think that would really uh resonate with people and maybe even build off that build off that image too of um what does faith as as that last resort or aspiration actually look like and feel like um it looks like that one finger just <laughs> making its way through all the feet trying to trying to touch that cloak mm-hmm. all right well I'll lead us to lamentations then if i can do that yeah which i'm more willing to talk about but <laughs> um <laughs> you know this is chosen to go with mark five and I've, I really appreciated the final paragraph of the commentary on this, which said, uh, don't connect this to the gospel reading. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, Lamentations is talking about a very particular kind of suffering mm-hmm. in a very particular historical circumstance. And it's, it's, it, in a sense, it has to say things like the God causes grief because that's part of the larger theological movement of what's going on. And there's no way that a temple can get destroyed and a nation can be brought to exile without some kind of superhuman force. But I think it's really unhelpful to pair this with Mark five personally, unless you're going to spend time explaining that. But I frankly, as a preacher, wouldn't even risk it. I just would, I would leave lamentations for another day simply because there's too many people who, are ill and believe that they've somehow angered God. Yeah. Well, and the other the other dangerous connection too is the language of wait. It is good that one should wait quietly, and I get that that's possible connection too, or it could be connected to Jairus. You know, he has to wait until mm-hmm. well, how 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 long? And so that could get really, I think, homile- homiletically unhelpful as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I almost wonder if this was my thought. I almost wonder if this is better paired with the Samuel text, um, because you have the you know you have the lament of David, you know, which the commentary talks about. But um, but you have that lament of David over Jonathan, and so mm-hmm. I wonder if if it's better paired there to um, n- to talk a, even a little bit about about the genre of lament, um, and the invitation to lament and when, um, what does that, you know, and then, and then bringing in the background of lamentations, um, and then the fact that we have that even included in in the canon. Um, and I don't know, that might be one thing to do. I'm with you on that, Caroline. And I was grateful for the commentary's note of that, 
um, don't 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 do it with with the gospel, but it 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 does parallel very well with the reality of ancient Israel in Second Samuel, um, but also um, um, the lament uh, of 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 this very real loss that that David is experiencing here. I am, however, prepared to pair Psalm thirty constructively with Mark five. Oh, okay. what will you do with that? And I, well, I just think everybody should read Joel Lamont's commentary, which is a, a rerun, but a very, very good one. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. In terms of talking about all of the uh, the opposites, right? Night and day, morning dancing, oh, yeah, yeah, and things like that, and the way it kind of captures the, um, yeah, not even the emotions of healing, but the fervor that comes with celebration and deliverance. It's just powerful powerful language and how you might talk about that and how you might liturgize. Is that a verb? Sure. These kinds of experiences of deliverance. Yeah. The weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I mean, there's... Not one of my favorite verses. (laughs) You're more of a night person, aren't you? (laughs) No, I love this verse. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. No, I think that's really, I think that's really helpful, Matt. Um, and, uh, and particularly, well, much more helpful than the Lamentations pairing, but it's acknowledging of the linger, uh, the lingering of the night. Um, but, but it's also, um, that also narrates hope in God at the same time with the joy coming in the morning. And so, uh, and, and, and maybe, a place to land is in that, you know, in that tension of, um, of the weeping and the joy and, uh, uh, never knowing how long one's going to last. I don't know. How long the night's going to last. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, uh, 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 I mean, for, you know, selfish reasons, yes, I do love this text, but actually, um, uh, in my first parish, uh, there was a woman who, um, a young woman, uh, who found out she had cancer and, uh, lived with cancer for nine years before dying. Um, and when she died or her husband asked that I do, do the funeral because that was what she had requested. And he shared with me her journal and, um, at the end, um, A lot of what she had written, she was on morphine. A lot of what she was written, we could not decipher. Um, But uh, in her journal, which she had kept from finding out that she had cancer all the way to the very end, uh, she moved from begging God to heal her and doing everything that she humanly could do uh, to recognizing who God is, whether she was cured of cancer on this side of the grave or not. And so um, the next to last um, decipherable entry was her praising God for her recognition that God was worthy to be praised, even though she was going to die. And then there were a couple of entries we couldn't read. And then this one, which was, you have turned my mourning into dancing. And that is why the 30th Psalm is so incredibly powerful to me, uh, because I watched a young woman share how she came to recognize God is God. And even in the midst of her tragedy, her suffering and loss, God is worthy to be praised. And I'm grateful to have that experience from early on in my ministry because it has really shaped how I've trusted God in the in the most um, frightful moments along the journey. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, it's powerful. Thanks for letting me share that. Yeah, yeah. Um, on a totally different topic, Second Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we skipped over about what ten or so chapters to to get here. You've missed a lot, a lot of civil war, a lot of Philistines, a lot of David running like a local mob boss, and now 
<laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, but now Saul and his sons have just been killed by the Philistines at the end of first Samuel. And so there is no successor to the king in terms of lineage. So, yeah. So here we go. That's partly a way of saying David didn't want the job. He wasn't vying for the job. He didn't kill anybody to get the job, but we know he's already been anointed and soon a bunch of people are going to come and say, we'd love you to be king for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. next week. But first it's uh, lament. Yeah, that's where the commentary on lamentations was spot on in terms of there's plenty in lamentations to preach without, <laughs> without going anyplace else. Uh, and I, um, and, you know, Joy knows this when, when we, when we teach preaching, we acknowledge and talk about a lot that so important about preaching is remembering that it's not only the proclamation of God's word, but it is a it is an act of leadership. It is a modeling of theological thinking. It is uh, it is teaching biblical interpretation, how to read scripture. But it is um, so very frequently a decision of pastoral care, and uh, and so uh, is this. You know, is this the weekend to talk openly about lament uh, and the power of lament, not just not just the presence of it, but what does lament do? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and where where does the where does church, where does um, theology give space for lament uh, and and those opportunities to um, to be affirmed in that, I think is a, a really important pastoral decision on the part of a preacher. And then here you see it from you know a king or soon to be king, in in a in a loss of a dear 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 friend, and so, um, not only on lamentations but in this story, and um, so I think yeah I, it's, mm, and how it, how it connects with grief and all of that, but I I do think that um, it, it's it reminded me a little bit too of some of the work I did a couple of years ago on my. Uh, on my recent book with uh, trauma and resurrection stories, and and the way in which we, and the way in which uh, there is space in scripture for grief and weeping and and trauma and uh, and uh, and loss and and where is it that we as preachers are giving um, space for that in our preaching? So anyway, that was kind of a long thing, but. Anyway. And so important, that pastoral care piece, that this can be an opportunity to expose. If you hadn't paid attention to uh, that relationship between Jonathan and, and, and David that we're introduced to um, uh, a couple of weeks back, um, it, it, this would be the time to, to pull that thread, uh, as you've noted, Caroline, that this is a future king who's had a great loss. And we often look at the Psalms for its praise. Well, it's important also to look at Lamentations for how well it captures, gives vocabulary for, um, for loss, for pain, for grieving. Um, and, and so, yes, I think, think, think it, would, it would be well worth taking this time to do that. If, if that's what your congregation and community needs at this point. That's all way more interesting than what I was going to talk about. So that's all good. <laughs> Why, what were you going to tell I doubt that. But what were you going to say? Were you going to take us uh, in, in a little bit more with, uh, with uh, Samuel? I was going to talk about the Song of the Bow, which is written in the book of Jasher. Wow. Because wow. I have it. Oh, Ooh. that's I have a copy of the book of Jasher. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's one of these conspiracy theory things. When you're a semi professor, people give you weird gifts. So <laughs> true. I have that. The book of Jasher. I have all the secret knowledge from the ancient world. 
here. Oh. Um, yes, this is all good. We'll have time to criticize David in other places, yeah. but this is, um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, this is part of the mixed bag that you get when you, when you look at David, but I'm with you both, right. Particularly in the, uh, the, the language of lament, but also looking at this, th- this, this really, really, really weird relationship between David and Saul which is violent and it's a, it's a civil war, but David like does not want to kill Saul. Saul tries to kill David. David has his particular respect. Jonathan is in many ways a threat to the throne for David. Mm-hmm. And yet they have this relationship. It's just, it, it's a nice reminder that life is really rarely cut and dry with really neat, <laughs> clear um, rights and wrongs and, you know, clear boundaries and things like that. And we navigate those and they're painful. Um, mm-hmm. And even, even strife doesn't make grieving any easier. In fact, it might make it harder. Speaking of which, Paul needs money sent to Jerusalem. <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a really weird mix of texts this week. All good in their own way, but we've jumped also way ahead now in Second Corinthians. Yeah. Yes. It might even be part of a different letter for all we know. Who knows? But this is part, chapter eight and nine, Paul has this really interesting appeal to raise money for the church in Jerusalem, which appears to have been notoriously poor or poorly resourced and in need of help. And Paul's asking a bunch of, you know, urban Corinthians I don't know how many hundreds of miles away that is by sea to support these people they've never met in a church in a city they might not have ever heard of. So it's interesting the way he talks about gift mm-hmm. about and what? abundance and need. Gift. Oh, uh huh. Gift. Mm-hmm. Which we might note it's the same word for grace right. in Greek. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and again, instead of just saying like give money, it's the nice thing to do, he sets Christ up as the example, right? He's well, given a theological basis for how we ask about money. Yeah. That's the thing, right? I mean, it's, um, so that language of, of rich, but for your sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, you become rich. It's all of a sudden, yeah. Taking, you know, what, what's even familiar to us perhaps from second or from Philippians, right. Um, Mm -hmm. who, uh, enters into, you know, the humanness and, um, so yeah, it's really interesting how he takes that and <laughs> um, you know the humiliation of Jesus, but then yeah. then puts it in this richness, rich poor language to yeah make an appeal for some churches and organizations. Today is the last day of the fiscal year. So <laughs> of the what year? Of the fiscal year. Oh yeah, June third. There you go. So you might want to talk about you know money and support and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that could be, uh, or save it for your stewardship sermon. I'm not being cynical, <laughs> I swear. I'm really. Oh, I know, not. I know, I know. <laughs> or you can- but in case people are like, why are you telling us about this in June? You can be like, well, there's this thing called the lectionary, and hey, it's June 30th. <laughs> right, <laughs> it fits. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.